Well, not only is it Memorial Day weekend, it is Pentecost Sunday, everybody. Now, y'all have to pray for me because I have to weave a message on Memorial Day, Pentecost Sunday, and the resilient sermon series that we're in. And I'm going to do that today. And I really believe that today's message will touch your heart and touch your life as we talk about becoming resilient. And we're in week four. Can you believe it? Week four of the sermon series, Resilient. And if you haven't already purchased the book, get the workbook with the streaming videos. If you're not able to plug into transform groups, um, download the app, the one minute pause app so that you can journey with us on 30 days towards resilience. And for those attending Transform Groups, um, this sermon will be the introduction to this week's topic. I believe it's session three. Today, I want to talk to you about unconverted places. But before we do that, we're going to read God's Word today. And I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles or your cell phones, your Bible app, you don't have a Bible app, you can go to the app store, download the Bible app, and it's there for you. Um, Because we're going to read several verses of scriptures together, and we're going to begin with Matthew 26. All right, Matthew 26, beginning with verse 69. We're going to go a little old school. If you have it, say amen. Amen. I'll wait for the rest of y'all. Back in the day, you used to hear the pages. Now I hear the swoosh, swoosh, swoosh of the phone as you go through your phone. Matthew chapter 26, beginning with verse 69. Let's dive in together. Reading from the New International Version. I always forget that. NIV. Here we go. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the getaway, the gateway, where another serving girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth, and this dude denied him again. Can't believe this. With an oath, I swear. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing were up um, where Peter was went up to Peter and said, surely you're one of them. Your accent gives you away. (laughs) Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them. I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Give you a moment to jump to Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, as we celebrate Pentecost Sunday. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, say suddenly, Suddenly, my favorite word in the scripture, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came down from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them, somebody say all of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven because it was the Feast of Pentecost, 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus. That's where the, the, the Pentecost means 50. 40 days after the, after the ascension of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, they heard the sound, actually the ascension of Jesus. They were utterly amazed They ask, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans, then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, 
Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Jerusalem, Cretans and Arabs were hearing them declare the wonders of God in their own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they answered and asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Sounds like that's what could have happened. But then, who stands up? Who? Which Peter? Yeah, that Peter. Peter stands up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose, for it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all people, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Imagine Peter preaching the paint off the walls. In verse 19, I will show wonders in the heaven above the above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Can we jump to 37? Scroll up a little bit to 37. I'm almost done. Hang in there with me. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In verse 39, who is the promise for? It is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Verse 41, our last verse, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number on that day. May the Lord add his blessing to that word this morning. Unconverted places. Do you ever feel... Like you're really doing great in life. You feel calm. You feel centered. Things are going well in your relationships. Things are going well at work. It's a beautiful, sun, sunny day, and you're on your way to work, and there's no traffic, and it's just like this is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. You feel it. You're feeling it. I just feel like things are going all too well until a family member says something that offends you, a driver cuts you off on the road, your spouse does something to get on you or to nag you. How many know what I'm talking about, right? Things are going well till you get into work and your boss is grumpy and he begins to yell at you and tell you all the things that you didn't get done. And at that moment, something rises up within you and we tend to react instead of respond. And how many know that when we're pressed and pressured, sometimes the ugly comes out? You ever been ugly? Has ugly ever come out of you when you least expect it? Ugly comes out sometimes at the Walmart line. Ugly comes out sometimes at the Dunkin' Donuts. Ugly sometimes comes out at work. Ugly sometimes comes at home. But have you ever noticed that ugly comes out when you feel pressure or overwhelmed or flooded in your soul? You know, your pastor, many people might think that your pastor was born of a virgin in Bethlehem 
in a manger in Bethlehem, and the angels of the Lord sang, and some people think you're a pastor, you don't struggle, but, but this pastor was not born in Bethlehem, this pastor was born in the Bronx. And I just want to tell you something, that Jesus might live in my heart, but the Bronx is still in my bones. How many know what I'm talking about? Yeah, not that good part of the Bronx. As a kid growing up, I had to, I had to be strong. I had to fight off the bullies. I had, to, I, ha- I had to be strong. I had to, like, just fight off the kids that were, that were picking on me. I went to school and took the public school bus at a very young age, and I had to know how to be street smart, protect myself, guard myself, look out for the strangers. How many know what I'm talking about? Right? So, so when I got saved and came to Christ, I became a new creation inwardly. The old is gone and the new has come, but there was a part of me that has yet to be converted. It had a part of me that had yet to experience the transforming power of Jesus. That's why when people in the past come at me or people say things about me or people talk about my mama, I want to go after you. And I don't care how old you are or how old I am. If you talk about my mama, I'm going to bring my 50-year-old friends and we're going to find you. I don't care if they're on medication. I don't care if they're limping. I don't care if they're overweight and limping. We're going to find you. Don't talk about my mama. Why? Jesus is in my heart, but Bronx is in my bones. And you're laughing because the same thing is true with all of you, right? With all of us. We come to Christ. We receive salvation. But there's that sinful nature, that sinful side of us that sometimes comes out when we least expect it. And I've spent, time, I spent years and time working on myself. I, I've, been in, I've been in counseling. I still go to counseling. I'm a big fan of counseling. That has saved me. I have spiritual director. I have a coach. I have companions and friends and people. And I have a wife that can show me and reflect to me those moments when I'm not acting so Christ-like and so holy. Who we are and what we love and how far we are willing to trust God are revealed when we are truly hard-pressed. When we are hard-pressed, when we go through tests and trials, who we really are comes to the surface. How many know what I'm talking about today, right? Who we really are. We all can smile here on a Sunday and act like we got it all together, but who are you when you're experiencing conflict? Who are you when they talk about your mama? Who are you? How do you respond when someone comes at you, when someone talks about you? But who are you when there's uncertainty in the future? Who are you when you're given a not so great diagnosis from the doctor? Who are you when they tell you that we are in a global pandemic and we don't know what the future holds? Over these past three years, we've all been through some stressful situations, am I right? Watching the news, experiencing the trauma of people losing their life, experiencing people getting sick and maybe the fear of you getting sick. Was I the only one that thought that I had COVID like five times before I actually got it? Especially those first few months, you get a little sniffle, it's allergy season. We had, things got shut down in March and then spring comes in April and May, I have a sniffle, oh my God. But what comes to the surface when we're under pressure? What comes to the surface when we're being tested? And you know what came to the surface for me, some of the times, was fear, anxiety, uncertainty. What comes to the surface or what came to the surface for you when you went through what we went through over these past three years? 
those things that came to the surface, whether it be doubts and fears and anxiety and uncertainty, those are places in our soul that need to be transformed by God. Now, it's okay to have fear. Fear is not, to, fear, fear is not a bad feeling, but if we allow fear to control our future, then how many know there's an unconverted place that needs to be transformed by the power of God? Let me ask you this morning, what's your unconverted place? What's the place in your heart and your life that you need God to transform? What's that place in your heart that you need God to change within you? We all have unconverted places within us. We all have places in our soul that have yet to be touched and transformed by the power of Jesus. That unconverted place may not just be a fear or anxiety. It could be an addiction. It could be a habit. It could be what you watch and what you click on or what you ingest in your body or what you look at. The reality is we all have unconverted places. And if we are not careful, those unconverted places can take our feet out in life, can knock us down, and cause us to doubt God and doubt the certainty of God and doubt the promises of God. And my friends, that's exactly what's happened over these past, not just three years, these past 20 years. I don't know if you realize this, but over the past 20 years, George Barna came out with a study as to the state of the church in 2020. And this is what George Barna said in 2020. He said, 23 million Christians have gone from practicing Christians to agnostics, atheists, or none. I want you to think about that for a moment. Over these past 20 years, I've been here 14 years, almost the entire time that I have been here, 14 if I've stayed 20, we have seen millions of people go from being practicing Christians to agnostic or atheists. And as a matter of fact, you don't need to go far to see that happening. Just look at the empty seats around you. Just look. Just look at the great falling away that we're in today. And this is, this is the reality of the season we're in. My friends, my friends, listen. We are living in the last days. We are living in the end times. We are living at the end of the age. It has been said that by 2034, the Bible would have been translated in every language known to man. And because of the internet, the gospel is being preached throughout the world even now. And Jesus said, before the coming of the man, before the coming of the Son of Man, the gospel will be preached. My friends, it's happened now. Now. There are no more unreached people groups to reach they have all been reached. They're all being reached. The world has been introduced to the gospel. And what does Jesus say is gonna happen in these last days? Many will turn from the faith. And you know what I'm learning and what John Eldridge really is introducing to all of us in this book called Resilience? This is what he says. It's our unconverted places that are gonna take our legs out from under us during times of testing and difficulty. Those times of testing and difficulty is those unconverted places. Because what happens when we face testing? What happens when we face trial? You know, you know the strength of your faith when you go through trials. You know which God you serve 
when you lose your job. You know which God you serve when you get that, that diagnosis. You know which God you serve when you experience uncertainty for the future. And you know what I've seen over the past three years is people are just crumbling under the pressure of politics, crumbling under the pressure of the problems of the world, crumbling in fear and crumbling in anxiety. And normally what people do when they're dealing with these, the, the, the testing and the trials, they try to escape. They try to escape. And instead of turning to God and escaping to God, they turn to temporary pleasures that satisfy the longing of the soul, but just for a moment, but don't solve the real problem. What we need is to bring our unconverted places in our lives and ask God to transform them. Because those unconverted places can actually knock our feet to the ground and cause us to tap out on our faith, tap out on God. And don't tell me it's not possible, my friends. It's happening. It's happening. People who once followed Jesus are no longer following Jesus. Pastors who once pastored churches no longer pastor churches. They're now atheists. They now teach against the church. Just, just Google it, research it. What we're seeing at this moment is a great falling away because people fail to deal with their unconverted place. You see, Peter, 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 wonderful Peter. Peter was a follower of Jesus. Peter was a disciple of Jesus. Peter is known to be the first pope. Did you know that? All the popes trace themselves back to Peter, St. Peter. That's why they call the church St. Peter's, right? St. Peter, the main church in Rome, right? They all trace their lineage, not lineage, their, 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 their positions to Peter. Peter was the first pope. Peter followed Jesus. Peter saw miracles. Peter walked with God. Peter was there in the Last Supper, yet Peter was the one when under pressure, I'm tapping out. I don't know who this man Jesus is. I don't know who he is. Peter, but we saw you with him. I'm tapping out. I don't know Jesus. Three times, Peter, 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 the first pope, denies Christ. He's the reason why Jesus was arrested. They tried to associate with him to, the, to Jesus, and Peter denied it all. Peter had an unconverted place in his life, a place that was not fully surrendered to God. Oh, sure, outwardly, he appeared to be fully surrendered. He walked with Jesus, saw the miracles of Jesus. He actually, he actually tried to keep Jesus from giving his life. That's why Jesus spoke to him and, and said, Satan, get behind me. That was Peter. Peter was the one who was a loser fisherman trying to catch fish. Jesus gets into the boat and, and, and performs a supernatural miracle. Peter leaves it all to follow Jesus, yet his unconverted place almost cost him his soul, almost cost him his future. That unconverted place in his life is what led him to deny Christ. Actually, we know of another follower of Jesus named Judas, and he also had an unconverted place, but Judas, Judas, Judas did not repent. And Judas ends his life hanging himself, walking away from the faith, walking away from Jesus. Unlike Peter, Peter, what saved Peter was that Peter was able to see that there was an area of his life that was not fully surrendered to God. And once the rooster crowed three times, there's a powerful verse, we read it earlier, 
we read and see that Peter wept bitterly. What does that mean? Peter repented. Peter acknowledged that there was an area in his life that had not been converted, and at that moment, he repents. What do we do with the unconverted places of our lives when the pressure comes, when the testing comes, when we're dealing with doubts and uncertainties and unbeliefs? I want you to think about your unconverted places. What do you do with those places? Well, first, we bring them to God and we repent. Transformation begins with repentance, acknowledging that, God, I have doubts and I have fears. And I don't mean there's normal doubts. I mean, we're doubting the existence of God. We doubt the promises of God. We struggle with our future. We think it's the end of the world. And, and some of us just need to go back a, at the beginning of this pandemic and really acknowledge that we weren't really the strongest can I preach to you guys today? Can, I, can we go back in order to go forward? Because for some of us, we have reacted more like pagans than we did followers of Jesus. We were controlled by the fear of the news instead of by faith. What is that just saying? There's an area of my faith that needs to be strengthened an area of my life. That, that's why James says, count it all joy when you fall into trials of various kinds because trials produce perseverance and faith. Isn't that awesome? I thank God for the trials and the struggles and the testing because it revealed who I really was and I acknowledged the fact that I need forgiveness. God, I repent for doubting you. I repent for not trusting you. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Repentance means we're turning away from something and turning to God. What is going to get us through the next crisis that we're going to face? What's go Do we think that it's going to get easier? You see, what has softened us is comfort. Comfort has softened us. Comfort has made us weak. Comfort. We seek comfort. We strive for comfort. We want comfort. And in, the, in, in comfort, we have lost our resilience, our internal drive, the inner strength to fight through problems. And the moment a problem hits us, we melt. I see it in the youth. I see it in the young people. Our youth are really struggling mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I see it in young people. I see it in, in, in middle-aged people. When they face one trial, it's almost like the end of the world. Have you said that lately to your teenager? It's not the end of the world. Or have they told that to you? Mom, dad, it's not the end of the world. But we sure act like it sometimes. So, so, so how did Peter overcome his, his deal with his unconverted place in, in, in his doubt with Jesus and doubt with God? He repented. Say, Lord, forgive me. I placed my faith in men instead of you. What do you need to do? Repent. Lord, forgive me. I placed my faith in my job. I placed my faith in my finances. I placed my faith on a person. I placed my faith in other things except for you. Lord, I turn from everything and everyone, and I turn to you. You are my king, you are my savior, you are my provider, you are my healer, you are my strong tower, you are my rescuer, you are my strength. In the days we live in, we need strength more than ever. We have to cling to God more than ever. We have to hold on to Jesus more than ever. We, this is not a time, this is the great divide. This is, this is when, when people are falling away and, and then the people of God are getting stronger. That's what's happening. You're, you're seeing the stronger get stronger. 
and you're seeing the weaker get weaker, and you're seeing the great divide. Why? Jesus is coming for a one-minded, one-hearted church. He's not coming for a divided church. He's not coming for people who are half in the church and half in the world. He's coming for people who are passionately in love with him. He's coming for people who are desperate for him. He's coming for people who know him, who have a relationship with him, who hold on to him. Come on, church, right? That's who he's coming for. Transformation begins with repentance, but transformation happens through the Holy Spirit. How does this process happen? Well, we see Peter. Peter repents. Think about how bad he felt for 40 days. So Jesus, he, he, he turns from his doubts and turns to Christ and follows him. And as Jesus walked the earth for 40 days, he said, wait for the promise of the Father. I'm going to send to heaven. 40 days after the resurrection, I'm going to send and go to heaven. But wait for the promise of the Father. Wait in the upper room. Peter, full of doubts. Peter, full of fears. Peter, embarrassed. Peter, working on himself. He goes to the upper room. And 10 days while they're sitting there, which is 50 days after the resurrection, which Hence, it's called the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost meaning 50 on the 50th day. In Acts chapter 2, we read, suddenly there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the church. And Peter was transformed by the Holy Spirit. Peter was filled with power. Peter was filled with strength. Think about it. Just a few days before, he's denying Christ. He's cursing. He, he, he's swearing. He's swearing, saying, I am not, I am not, I, I am not following Jesus. I don't know Jesus. Fifty days later, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And he stands up and begins to prophesy and begins to preach and begins to tell people what this is all about. He said, this is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel, that in the last days I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. That Peter, that denier, was transformed into a prophet. He went from denying to prophet. He went from, from wimp to warrior. At that moment, what was the difference? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He created space in his soul for this Holy Spirit to come and to transform his inner life. He had the strength of God within him. My friends, what we need now more than ever is to be filled and to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If we are going to endure the days that are coming, if we are going to endure the days that are ahead, if we are going to endure the tough times we're going to face as individuals in our own personal lives, the tough times we're going to face globally, the tough times we're facing now, what we need is to be filled with a power that is far greater than our human strength, a power that comes from the Holy Spirit. What we need is to be baptized with God's Spirit. Look at what Matthew 24, 10 says. It says, and at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Pause. Do you see that's happening now? This is Jesus. He's saying at that time, this is what's going to be happening. And then in verse 11, he says, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Do you see what's happening now? All the different religions, all the different prophets, all the people proclaiming they're the way, the truth. Even the devil himself is being exalted as one who won't judge you. Just go to Target. You'll, re you'll see the shirts. It says Satan won't judge you. Or Satan, what does it say? Satan respects pronouns. Even Satan is trying to elevate himself. False prophets will appear and deceive many. And verse 12, because, because of this wickedness and the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Do I need to explain that? Have you experienced it? But what does he say in verse 13? But the one... 
Oh, I wish y'all were with me today, right? But the one who stands firm to the end. The one who stands firm to the end will be safe. How? How do we stand firm when the waves are crashing, when things are coming against us, when unexpected challenges, when unexpected problems, when now, can I be honest, can I speak truth, being a Christian is almost um, described as a hate crime. Like if you're a Christian now, you hate people. Where did that come from other than the pit of hell itself? What do we do? How do we endure? How do we endure the tough times? How do we endure when people say you're a bigot or when they say you're a racist or just because you are a Christ follower? Just because I preach the truth of God's word, not my truth, but the truth of God. How, how, how do I deal with what's coming? My friends, the freedom we have here today may not be freedom tomorrow. Oh, y'all not ready for today. Y'all came, y'all thinking barbecue. Y'all thinking barbecue. You're thinking, what's the, what time am I going to get the ribs on? But let me wake up. Wake up. It's time to wake up. It's time to recognize the season and the time we're in. This is not a time to have a fake faith. This is a time to grab a hold of God and walk in truth and walk in power. How do we do that? I'm almost done. Acts 1 7. He said to them, It is not. So, so this is what's happened. They're wondering when the end of the time is coming. And Jesus said, It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, there's a set time for his return. It's not, it's not, it's not for you to know the time, but this is what Jesus said. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Oh, my goodness. How do we receive power? We bring our unconverted places to God and say, Lord, I need your power. I need your spirit. I need you to invade my heart and my life. I need a walk in power. I need the strength of God to endure. I need the strength of God just to share my faith. I never imagined that we would live in a time where sharing our faith is telling others about the love of God can be viewed so negatively. Never imagined that we would be in this season where saying the name of Jesus, you can be crucified. Well, what does Paul say? What, what do we do? Paul says, I got so many verses, I'm out of time. Oh, man, this is the problem. I need like an hour. I want you to skip those verses. Go to skip 1 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Go to the next slides, guys. Okay, let's start with here, Romans 8, 11. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. You know, one day we're going to all pass away, and hopefully it's later, not now. <laughs> we'll all pass away, and, and we, will, we will see Paul, or we, we will see, no, we will see Moses, and we will see Elijah, and we will be asking them questions. Moses, how was it to take the children of Israel through the Red Sea? We'll see David. David, how was it to, to knock Goliath down? How was that? Like, tell me about it. We'll see Elijah. Elijah, how was it when you called down fire from heaven? And they'll be describing that moment. But then, but then Moses and Elijah and Ruth and Elisha, they will turn to us and ask us, how was it? to have the power that raised Jesus from the dead live in you. How was it? How was that to have resurrection power 
in you. See, in the Old Testament, it just came upon people. But in the New Testament, it is now within people. Yet we walk around in life like we are broke, we're poor, we don't have power, we're weak. They tell us it's the end of the world, and we go and we buy toilet paper. Like, 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 like some of y'all still using the toilet paper you bought in 2020, and it's expired. It's already expired. And you're using toilet paper, and you're just like, because you're afraid, you're like, it's the end of the world. No, it's not the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. You know what that means? No weapon formed against you will prosper. Whatever comes at you, there's a greater spirit within you. You know what that means? Greater is the one within me than anything that's in this world. You know what that means? Whatever the diagnosis, whatever the the, the, the tragedy, whatever the pain, whatever the crisis, whatever the difficulty, whatever the devil throws at me, there is a spirit, there is a power, there is an inner strength within me that makes me not just a conqueror, I am more than a conqueror. I am the head, not the tail. I am moving forward in faith, not shrinking back in fear. I am trusting. I am believing. I am not going to walk in defeat. I am not going to walk in darkness. I am going to walk by faith and not by sight. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise, church. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now, remain standing. And I leave you with this. Remain standing. The transformation happens throughout our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. But lastly, transformation is complete when Jesus returns. (laughs) And 1 Corinthians 15, 52 tells us, do that last verse for us. I got to get this one in. It will happen in a moment the blink of an eye when the last trumpet is blown and when that trumpet is sound those who have died will be raised to live forever and we who are living will also be transformed ultimately I gotta close because there's another service we gotta do but let me ask you this question what unconverted place in your life keeping you, holding you back. What unconverted place in your life is knocking you off your feet of faith? What do you need to bring to Jesus to say, Jesus, transform my life? Don't hold on to those unconverted places because it will be those unconverted places that will come out when you're under pressure and stress and testing. That's why scriptures say, stay steadfast, firm, immovable. Be firm. As all hell breaks out around you, have the peace of God, the strength of God. Let people look at you and say, why are you so calm? Why do you have so much peace? Don't you know the ship's going to go down? Well, the ship goes down. Whatever my future holds, I know who holds my future. I know where I'm going. Let's bow our heads. If you're here today, I want to invite Jesus into your heart and life. If you're attending online, I want to invite Jesus into your heart. Just lift your hand. We're just right where you see to say, Jesus, I need you. I need your power. I need your strength. I need your spirit. If you need the strength of God, why don't you lift your hand and say, I need the strength of God today. I need the resilience of God. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Just raise your hand. Come on, church. Open your hearts to Jesus. Come on, church. I need the Holy Spirit. I need the strength of God. I need the resilience of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, we invite you, Holy Spirit. Baptize us with power. Baptize us with your spirit. Fill us to overflowing, we pray. People are watching, fill them to overflowing, we pray. That we may walk in power and anointing. That we may be able to withstand 
the attacks coming our way. Lord, thank you for this time. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody together said, Amen.